So welcome to our Ask the Expert session on medication adherence in lupus. We're extremely fortunate to have Professor Eisenberg here to answer some key questions which have emerged from my time um, spending with patients in the Lupus UK patient support group meetings over the last few months. Um, so I thought we'd just kick off with the first question that emerged from the session. Um, what does the actual term medication adherence mean? Well, it probably means slightly different things to different people, yeah. but, but I think from the physician's point of view, uh, it, remi it, it, it in essence means that your patient is, is in a sense willing to take the medication that you have prescribed for them. Uh, now that may be a, a complete thing, it may be a partial thing, uh, certainly patients will say things to me like, uh, I did take it for a month or two months or whatever, this particular drug, and then I, I wasn't quite so good. Mm. Uh, in a way, I think everybody has the experience, for example, of being prescribed a five-day antibiotic course, and the number of people who actually finish a five-day antibiotic Absolutely. course is probably rather small. So it's it's really the, the ability to take medications in the way that they are meant to be taken. Okay, great, thanks. I think that's a great introduction to what, what will follow. And um, amongst our lupus population here at UCH, how common do you think, or how much of a problem is this, is, is the medical medication? Well, I, I don't think it's just a UCH problem. I, th I yeah. think it's a, it's a, it's a worldwide of problem. Uh, we are asking patients to take uh, some very powerful medication, medication which may have nasty side effects, and just occasionally those side effects can be fatal, of course, in the case of severe infections. Mm. So this is not a trivial thing. But of course, lupus is not a trivial disease, and it's always a balance. And uh, you don't want to undertreat your patients, but neither do you want to overtreat your patients. So, trying to work with your patients to make sure that they're taking the drugs that you recommend in the way that you recommend them is um, absolutely vital, I think, in, in order both to get the patients better, but at not too high a cost. Yes. Exactly. Um, and do you think it's an important topic to discuss amongst patients and healthcare professionals? And, oh, I and think it's, it's tr truly vital. I mean, uh, the, there's no point really for in a physician prescribing drugs for a patient which the patient clearly isn't going to take and has no desire to take. Uh, I think patients, by and large, listen to their doctors. I think that, that is true. But in the end, no doctor is going to stand over mm. a patient 24-7 and say, we've got to take this drug. You know, In the end, the patient has to be convinced that it's the right thing to do. Uh, and that the frequency with which they have to take these drugs and for how long they have to take them are very, very important questions. And when patients come to me, for example, with lupus nephritis, I try to be realistic and I say, look, we're going to give you some medication. It will probably be steroids. It will probably be immunosuppressive drugs. And I have to be honest with you, this is a very serious part of lupus. Uh, it has the capacity, this disease in the kidneys, to destroy your kidneys. And that means a life on dialysis and mm. ultimately looking for transplant. That's not an easy life. And I think that there is very good, very compelling evidence that if you take the medications I'm going to prescribe, there's a good chance you will avoid that. And you try to balance up the advantages with the risks and try to persuade the patient that what you're prescribing is not something that you're doing just as, oh, I just fancy doing that today. Yeah. Uh, but it's for very good reasons. There are very good uh, evidential reasons for doing that. Uh, and that's why you want your patient to sort of follow the path of treatment that you're recommending for them. Exactly. Thank you. So I think, as you said, outcomes are actually affected by, by the, the, the amount of patients. Well, I, 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 in the case of lupus nephritis, for example, I would almost go okay. further than that. I, I would say to you that, um, in fact, I'll give you some numbers. We have about 725 lupus patients we looked after yeah. over the last 40 years, of which about 250 have significant kidney biopsy proven uh, lupus nephritis. And of those, about 40 have gone into kidney failure. And I'm very little doubt, and I work very closely with my nephrology colleagues, who I think will confirm this, mm. that of those 40 patients, the majority, the considerable majority, have gone into kidney failure because they don't take the medication. I think that's the number one cause. I think it's probably the number two cause and three cause. And really, it's lupus nephritis per se, which is the number four cause. So I think the sad truth is that in the case of lupus nephritis, if you don't take your medication, you increase your chances of going to kidney failure quite substantially. Okay, thank you. So that's a really good take home message for you know both patients and healthcare professionals sure. and to remember. And on this topic of medication adherence, do, do, are there any key contributing factors that you feel that in your clinical practice that you think contribute to patient, patients not taking their medications? Any particular yep. reasons why? Uh, certainly side effects is an important one. And if we take steroids as a good example of that, uh, it, it, my, my key belief is that as far as steroids are concerned, the best dose is the shortest possible, sorry, the smallest possible dose for the shortest possible yeah. period of time. But 
some patients are clearly quite susceptible in terms of developing a change in the shape of the face, for example. And it's very obvious to me that adolescent patients uh, and young patients, women in particular, most lupus patients are of course female, mm. do not like to change the shape of their face at all. And I have patients who've said to me, I will take up to 10 milligrams of steroids, but I will not take one milligram more because it changes the shape of my face and I'm not having that. Mm. Other patients have been given immunosuppressive treatments to treat lupus nephritis and other aspects of lupus and may get pneumonia and they may nearly die from that. And they will come back and they will say things, look, I've taken this combination, it's, it's too risky, I don't want to do it. Uh, again, going back to steroids, we have the problems of hypertension, of diabetes. So these are not trivial issues. Uh, and you have to be very patient with the patients and you have to explain to them in some considerable detail in, in some cases why this drug is important for them uh, and why yes you're going to try to keep the dose as low as possible but without these medications the, the, the risks to their health deteriorating substantially are very real and you have to get that balance right. Yes great okay thank you I mean hopefully uh, people listening to this uh, this video and especially doctors and nurses can really take those messages home and try and um, explain to patients uh, why it's important to take medicines. So is there anything that we're trying to do in as rheumatologists and uh, in the world of sort of immunology and helping our patients with lupus to try and persuade them to take the medication? Any any tools you can suggest? Uh, well I think communication is, is the most important mm -hmm. thing really. You, you have to talk to people. Um, it's no good saying uh, you've got X, I'm giving you Y, here's the prescription, go away. Uh, people are pretty savvy, savvy these days. They will go and look things up on yeah. the internet, they will Google things, and it is not infrequent now for a patient to say to me, I want to think about this. I, I hear you, but I'm not convinced. I want to go and do, do my homework, as it were. Or they come in with, with great sort of uh, sheaves of paper or their, their internet on their phone or whatever, and they will say, look, I've been reading about this drug, uh, mycophenolate. I, I see that it causes uh, a lot of nausea. Well, I, I've got some problems with my stomach, so there's no way I want to be taking this. Yeah. Or, you know, I've read about this methotrexate and I, and I read that it can cause terrible liver problems, so why should I be taking that? Uh, or I've read about rituximab and I understand that it can lower the total immunoglobulin levels and that increases the risk of infection, so why should I be taking that? And you have to persuade people with facts, so you have to be knowledgeable, you have to show them that yes, these, what, what you said is a concern, but I'm going to try and lay your concern with some information which I think it's important for you to have. And um, if we look slightly wider afield, uh, the taking of TNF-alpha blockers for patients with rheumatoid arthritis, when you do that, you have to explain to patients that there is a risk, especially in the first three to six months of infection. Mm -hmm. uh, I chaired the BSR's Biologics Committee for five years, and this was really quite a very, very big issue. Yeah. And it really does, it, you know, it really does uh, pay dividends to talk patiently uh, to people to explain to them why it is you want to put them onto these nasty drugs. And sometimes you have to be very, um, uh, you, you have to give a lot of information about the downsides of the disease itself to persuade them. And dialysis is one fear, but lupus rashes can be pretty ghastly. Mm -hmm. And you have to explain that they can be avoided if you take drug X or drug Y, like mouth, intravenously, whatever. Um, I think clearly what a lot of patients want is the perfect drug, the one that treats everything and has no side effects. And sadly, you have to explain to people that doesn't exist. Even the humble aspirin is responsible for the deaths of dozens of people in the UK every year because it irritates the lining of the stomach, causes bleeding. It's been around for 120 odd years. Yeah. And if, if something as simple as that can give rise to a lot of side effects, so these much more powerful drugs can also do the same and, and worse. So again, it's, it's communication, it's balance. That's what you're trying to achieve. Great, thank you. Um, and for families, I mean, a lot of our patients with lupus are very young and, you know, they're relying on friends, families, school, teachers, etc., to support them and guide them. Is there anything that, uh, uh, you know, people support? Well, the family issues, uh, in a sense, cut in several directions. Yeah. So patients may come and want to start a family. So That's they true. want to know what drugs can I safely take during pregnancy. And the, the classic example here is the patient who is doing very well on uh, steroids and mycophenolate, where you have to say, no, I'm really sorry, I know you're doing great, but you can't carry on with mycophenolate mm -hmm. during pregnancy. And with, with rituximab, the same, you have to be off that for at least a year, that's the recommendation. Um, steroids you can take during pregnancy, hydroxychloroquine, uh, azathioprine. So we've switched a number of patients yeah. off mycophenolate onto azathioprine in order that they can get pregnant, in order that they can, they can have their family. Now, from the point of view of family support, 
uh, lupus patients often come with family members, uh, the younger patients with their parents yeah. or the older siblings, uh, the older patients with, with their children. And again, uh, often it's the relatives who come in and say, oh, I've been reading about this and I, I think this is a dangerous drug for my sister, my aunt, my mother, my child to be taking. And you have to be prepared to answer that carefully and pragmatically. Mm -hmm explaining as best you can that this is not a nice disease and that uh, it does pretty ghastly things to your everything from your heart to your lung to your brain to to your kidneys and that's why you have to treat it quite aggressively and that although these drugs can have side effects in many cases they're predictable in many cases you can avoid them to a certain extent by yeah. the dosing that you use and that clearly you will be available if nasty side effects do come I make a point if patients are worried to give them my uh, my NHS secretary's number, direct dial number, avoid yeah. the dreaded hospital switchboard, <laughs> so they can get right through and they can leave me a message Excellent. and I say I or one of my colleagues will get back to you as soon as we can to discuss mm. any side effects that, that come up. And I think that is very helpful too. But again, it's part of communication. Of course, yeah, I think that reassurance really does help patients and yeah. their families. Um, and just to sort of uh, end on, I suppose, uh, something that emerged from the conversations I've had with patients with lupus is what are we trying to do to improve the adherence of medication in lupus? Uh, any, any projects going on at, at your centre? Well, um, first of all, in, in a sense, what your, your, your question kind of begs the other question, well, how often do patients not take the medication? Yeah. So <clears throat> again, let me give you a story. Um, I was involved in a study of hydroxychloroquine use with some colleagues in France. Now, they had the capacity to measure levels of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, they asked uh, my colleagues and I to send samples over to, or serum samples, over to... Um, uh, to France, where yeah. they would measure the level of the drugs in patients who I had prescribed hydroxychloroquine for. And as part of the, the research, I was asked to uh, estimate the chances that I thought the patient was actually taking okay. the drug. Now, I was quite shocked, I have to say. Um, we sent them about 53 or 54 samples, something like that. And uh, just under a third of the patients had levels which were either zero or certainly subtherapeutic. So when you think that hydroxychloroquine is probably the least toxic, the least unpleasant, uh, the least troubling of any drug, I think there's a very, very important message there that a significant number of patients are either not taking the drugs that you prescribe them at all, or they're taking them in lower doses than you think. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's kind of odd, really. Uh, the lady in France who was organizing the, uh, the research told me an interesting story. She said well, she had a patient who she was convinced was taking the drug. And she was working with her ophthalmologist to do some very sophisticated tests to yes. look for evidence of any damage, which, as you know, um, hydroxychloroquine can very rarely do over long periods of time to the back of the eye. And these tests were pretty unpleasant, painful, unpleasant. And she asked this patient if she would be willing to do this, uh, this unpleasant thing. And she said, yes, yes, of course, I would do that. And um, uh, a year later feeling almost worse, the doctor went back to the patient and said, look, I know you did this for me once, but I'd like to ask you as a very, very big thing if you'd do it again. And okay. the patient said, absolutely, of course, I'll do it again. And it turned out when they got around to developing the assay to measure the levels of this hydroxychloroquine, in this particular patient, it was zero. So the doctor said to the patient, you knew you weren't <laughs> taking the drug, and yet you had these horrific okay. tests on two occasions. Why did you do that? And the patient said, I didn't want to let you down. Oh. So that sort of story is, is, is very sad because clearly the, the patient genuinely wants to help the doctor, but at the same time, they're not helping themselves. Yeah. And uh, so, so that, that kind of um, little, little sting in the tail that exists. So, I think yeah, it yeah. boils down to the report. Clearly, yeah, yeah, you have an yeah. excellent report with your yeah. patients and the communication, as you're saying. Well, one, one thing you find when you get a little bit older <laughs> and you've known patients for a long time is that you can be very honest with them yeah. and they will be very honest with you back. <laughs> Good. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much. I think Pleasure. that's an excellent sort of roundup on medication great adherence, pleasure. the questions that were asked um, in the support group meetings that I attended. Um, you've really unlocked some key concepts and addressed some issues that uh, I think lots of people want to hear about patients, families and other healthcare professionals. Um, and we hope, I hope to be doing some research as well on this topic and hopefully, you know, sending out some surveys to patients and doctors. And I think one of the other key aspects, as you've talked about communication and experience, is that trainee doctors and um, lots of other rheumatologists haven't actually had form any formal training on, on communicating yeah. and how to actually... Uh, drive the consultation to tailor it to that patient to ensure sure. we're addressing the right things. Often we have a tick list of things: is the yes, urine yes, dipstick sure, done, yeah, is the blood yeah. pressure done, but the the main issue we don't address. So I think you know this may be something to look into further. Um, so yeah, so grateful for your time. Many thanks. Thank you very much.